Welcome to the Omakim EMDR Training Center, your go-to destination for a comprehensive journey through EMDR therapy. From laying the groundwork with the fundamentals to guiding you towards accreditation and advanced training, we are dedicated to fostering a deep understanding of the theoretical foundations and exploring innovative applications in EMDR therapy. In this podcast series, we dive into insightful conversations with some of the industry's most seasoned EMDR therapists, consultants, and trainers. Join us as we unravel the complexities of EMDR, providing you with valuable insights and perspectives that can enhance your practice. Today is a special episode as we have the privilege of host Ilan Shapiro. Ilan has devoted his professional career to making EMDR accessible to as many individuals as possible. In our discussion, we'll explore his personal EMDR journey. We will further delve into his recent work alongside Barit Lab, focusing on the development and dissemination of their groundbreaking approaches to handling recent traumatic events. Get ready for an enlightening conversation that promises to deepen your understanding of EMDR therapy and its transformative potential. I'm Dr. Donny Khan. Um, I'm the, the director of the Omakim EMDR Training Center in Israel. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of having a discussion now with, um, with Ilan Shapiro, who is, um, um, from what I understand, one of the first people trained in EMDR, uh, the, perhaps the very first group that was trained and as he mentioned to me earlier, it wasn't even EMDR then. Um, and uh, Elon Shapiro is, uh, has, has been in the world of EMDR for a very long time, as well as uh, one of the innovators of um, one of the probably most studied protocols that's out there. I believe um, RTEP and GTEP, if I'm not mistaken, has been studied probably more than standard EMDR. Oh, this is good. I wouldn't go as far as that, but I would okay. say the early intervention and uh, group right. protocols, it's a mark, yeah. Right. right. Well, when I look at the number of citations that are in the manual versus of, about EMDR and the num- from that at least is put out by the EMDR Institute and the number of citations that I have on RTEP and GTEP, I, I have about two extra pages on RTEP, GTEP beyond what's uh, now, I understand there's more stuff that's been studied in the MDR that's not in the EMDR manual. Anyway, um, you're also the the um, the winner of which award? The David the... Schreiber Award for Contribution to right. the MDR from the EMDR Europe Association. Yeah. Right. yeah. Anyway, so if you could just introduce yourself, because um, I'm sure I'm missing little pieces that I'd love to hear about of who you are. <laughs> <laughs> well... Let's let's talk about professionally. Uh, um, I'm a psychologist that I worked for about 30 years in a psychological service in um, Upper Nazareth. Mm-hmm. And, um, it was actually after I took early retirement that I did most of my productive work. I recommended recommended to everybody. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to follow your lead on that one. I'm like hitting my stride now. <laughs> do what I really wanted to. But, uh, let's say Does that include what I'm seeing behind you? Oh, yeah. That's what I was doing before I got to EMDR. All mm. right? yeah, and EMDR took that place. And if you, if you want to hear that story, I can tell you that story too. Um, you know, Rollo May, he, he talked in his classic book on the age of anxiety, defined uh, creativity as total commitment in the face of of total uncertainty all right that's nice yeah that's what you you know you're doing art you're not not painting by numbers but you um you uh have an idea that it, you're going to um you're going into un- uncertainty but you're going to trust the process that something good is going to come out of it all right and i would um um paraphrase that you know that's what i found in 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 emdr and if you want you know emdr has is both art and science it looks you know it's very structured and it looks uh, as though it's very scientific but there's a lot of art to it as well right. so that you you go into with the mdr you go into a situation where you're uh, you don't know what the outcome is going to be but you trust the process that it's going to be a good right. outcome Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, well, what's interesting, the difference between the process of art, I imagine, versus the process of EMDR therapy, when you're working with another person, 
you're actually trusting this other person who might not even trust the process. And you're mm -hmm. trusting their system to do exactly what it knows how to do, which is kind of cool. Yeah, uh, yes, and that's the philosophy behind the EMDR. Right. Uh, the AIP, adaptive information processing, is that people have this in, uh, inherent inbuilt system, uh, mechanism or capacity in the brain to resolve uh, disturbing experiences. And when, when you get stuck, EMDR uh, seems to help to release that natural processing. Right. And that's, that's the beauty of it, uh, you know, how we learn in the beginning to stay out of the way and not right. to interfere because we're distorting. Um, right. You know, th this is the part of trust. You mean I shouldn't be saying back to my clients every time they say something, repeating it back to them? Like they say, oh, I'm noticing something in my chest. Oh, you're noticing something in your chest? I shouldn't be doing that? Right. <laughs> <Okay>. Yeah. <laughs> Some of, our, okay. some of our sort of nasty habits that we've had from before, we have to let go of. Right. Anyway, going back to how I got to it. Um, yes. In, in, you know, Francine Shapiro did, um, discovered the um, uh, EMD. It was actually her doctorate uh, yes. back, in, back in 1987, where she first published. 87. Um, 80, yeah, 87. Yes. Uh, in 1989, she was invited to um, present at the stress conference in Tel Aviv, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, where she presented this. And, and, and uh, incidentally, she was also thinking about coming on Alia at that time. Mm -hmm. It was one of she came to check it out. And uh, the psychiatrist after, here convinced her not to, didn't they? Well, I'll tell you that story too, uh, <laughs> if you want. And then um, Muli Lahad from the um, uh, emergency center in Kiryat Shmona convinced her to give a workshop up in Kiryat Shmona, up in the north of Israel. Mm -hmm. And you know why I went there? Because, right. of her, because of her name, Shapiro, right? <laughs> That's what I was intrigued. Maybe it's a, you know, a, a, a cousin of mine that I didn't know about. And, and perhaps, perhaps she is. Uh, because they come from the same sort of uh, grandparents came from the same areas of, of Russia. Oh. Yeah. And um, there were 14. So it might, might be a distant relation, but not someone maybe, that. Maybe, maybe. You, you didn't find the, the family tree connection? Not, not directly, but we didn't look too hard. Okay. And um, the, um, there were 14 people there, including Alan Cohen and Muri and in fact, it was a two-day training that was pretty much the uh, forerunner of what followed. There was a there was a, a practicum, and it's in the practicum where the you know the ins you you get it you get it when you know as Bessel van der Kolk says there's something happening here that we better pay attention to. Right. So I just went off and and started uh, working with uh, what was EMD. Um, for the next two years, uh, I was and I sort of documented everything I did. Um, if, you know, I had about fifty or sixty cases and with impressive results. And I, so I wrote to her and I said, you know, I've, got, I've been found something. And that's what she said to us all: go out and see what you can do with it. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so she said, I'm, uh, "Come and see what we're doing with this now." And this was sort of two years later, and she invited me to come to the states to do what was now become level one and level two. And um, I was doing a, a, a practicum at that time, uh, or, um, not a practicum, um, I was two years in, in London, uh, uh, sabbatical. And um, I, I, went to the, I, I went to the States, I actually did level two first, because that's how it worked out. And then I did level one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> right. And, um, um, and as um, I, I, I like quoting, you know, I'm, I'm an Apple and a Mac user. And Ma I'm sorry. Mac users say, once you use Mac, you never look back, you know. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. Okay. That's exactly what happened to me with EMDR. Incidentally, mm -hmm. uh, by then it had become EMDR because, you know, she had noticed 
And like we all had noticed, that, and in fact, yeah. if you look carefully at her early videos, she wasn't doing really EMD, she was doing a lot more than that. And right. She, she was allowing more associations. And uh, it, and the, uh, um, so she changed the name to- Also, EMD. I'm realizing, I'm realizing right now, before you continue this story, that um, you spent two years really focused on desensitization. Well, you know what, well, as as she did, you, you yeah. it, the original EMD is very mechanical. It goes back, yes. goes back to target after every time. Yes. But in practice, that's not what she was doing. That's not what we were doing. <laughs> I'm just saying that the focus, your focus at that point was that, and and we'll talk about it later when we get to RTEP, is that how I'm, I'm realizing now just how much that was that thinking was already ingrained in your system. Well, she abandoned the MD, but she really- I know that. For emergency she came back later. But I'm just saying, I'm just looking no. at your process, that yeah. your process of how you perhaps came back to it, because you knew it probably better than most of the people out there. Because you had used it for two years. Possibly. Yeah, good. I hadn't thought of that. Yes. Yeah. So you know that after about 10 years, incidentally, she wanted to even change the name. She wasn't happy with the D Processing, in the yeah. MDR. Yeah. She wanted to take it out and call it reprocessing therapy. So right. she sent out the survey to people, what do you say? I suggested ART, adaptive reprocessing therapy, or accelerated mm -hmm. reprocessing therapy, right. but, but people didn't want to change the name. Because it already had name recognition. It's hard to keep on changing names. For the brand, yeah. And as she yeah. said, it's like Coca-Cola. You know, yeah. even when we took out the Coca. The cocaine, yeah. yeah it, they kept it in. All right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, um, you know, I was instrumental in bringing EMDR to Israel and forming the EMDR Association together with Gary and Udi. And, so I've got um, to tell you that my experience of you at that point was I would meet you um, pretty regularly at the at the conferences for the school psychologists. And you'd come over and say, you know, you really need to study this EMDR stuff. And I remember thinking, this guy's nuts. I mean, it seems nice. It sounds very convincing because he has a British accent. But aside from that, I'm going to like go there and do this to people and take money from them. Um, so like I kept on saying, yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> this is weird. Right. I know that was one of the obstacles. And incidentally, you yeah. know, she did several more workshops then in 1989. Apparently she did, she yeah. did eight, I believe. Mm -hmm. And one of them was at the most important venue in Israel at Tel Shomer Hospital, where mm -hmm. all the, the VIPs came, you know, the heads of the army and the heads of the mm -hmm. different hospitals and various things. And I heard later from Zahada Solomon, who was there, she said they didn't take it seriously. And mm -hmm. people went in and out. She did a demonstration that didn't work, <laughs> and and uh, in fact, they said they don't want to hear about EMDR again, or you know, they don't want to hear about it again. And so it started off really um, badly. And, yeah. And quite a while for it to come back in. Only after the research had compiled so much that right. Uh, right. that uh, it couldn't be ignored. And I'll tell you even something else. When I was doing the level two in uh, Philadelphia. Um, at the end, um, uh, Frankie Clough, who was there, an ex-Israeli, mm -hmm. is now living in, was living in, she said, oh, you must meet this Edna Foa. Edna Foa was at that training, at level, that level two training. And we said, hello, hello, in the, in the car park. And, uh -huh. uh, and then that's it. And then a few years later, Edna Foa was giving a, a plenary in, at the, a CBT conference in, in Tel Aviv, and I went up to her innocently and said, oh, how are you getting on with EMDR? So she said, in three years' time, nobody will remember what EMDR is. Well, um, interesting <laughs> little prophecy. Later there. on, yeah. later on, she said, well, of course it works, but not for the reasons they say. <laughs> right. I mean, the yeah, well. Research couldn't be ignored. Yeah, but yeah. She, she, did a lot uh, she she also had a stake in it. There was like a thing that was threatening her 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 stuff. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, she was really a big name and uh, with yeah. a 
Yep. Hey, look, P has got some good research too. Oh, of course, no doubt, and CBT so, in general. I'm and very I, happy that P exists. That's another story because while I was doing the sabbatical in in London, I was actually learning CBT at the Institute for Psychiatry, and I was thrilled with uh, having come back from uh, EMDR, and I tried to convince them to um, to uh, invite Francine Nova you know, to give a workshop. And they said, well, you know, we've got our program for the next few, two, three years. We're, no, we're not really interested. And then, so I thought, well, maybe I can try to uh, organize a training, but I, I, I didn't, nothing happened. And then in 1995, four, four or five, I was doing my facilitator trainings, which was in London and later in, in Amsterdam. Um, that was the first time um, um, uh, EMDR was being taught in, 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 in the UK in 1994. And I was in 92 in, in Philadelphia and uh, California. And uh, I was doing my Red Batch facilitator training where I was supposed to uh, um, observe and assist in the, in the practicum. And there was a psychiatrist there who um, didn't have a partner to do the to do the practical. So they asked me to be his partner. So I'm kind of supervising him, and I'm his patient, I'm his client. And I thought, well, oh, what can I what can I work on? I know it was this sort of guilt feeling that EMDR came to London two years later because I wasn't able to arrange a training there two years previously. All right? Okay. I just thought, well, I. That was that was the, the topic I took was sort of guilt, and um, and as I was you know working through it, mm -hmm. I came to the obvious realization there was no way I could have done it then. I, I didn't have the contacts and I didn't have the, mm -hmm. the occasion to do it, but I can do it in Israel. <laughs> so I went to Robbie Dunton and said, "Well, how can we bring MDR to Israel?" Mm -hmm. And you know because since her first training, nothing else was done there, and. Um, and a year later, we started the first trainings in, in Israel. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, Francine came and then uh, 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 Bill Zangwill, mm -hmm. Roger Solomon came many times. Yes. Um, and uh, Jerry, Jerry Puck came uh, several times. And they all came yes. like, uh, uh, you know, really sort of. Um, uh, for non-profit, not for profit, to get, and they, right. for the next until two thousand five years, we had right. several trainings a year until we trained enough local facilitators and Gary and Udi, and became trainers. Good trainers, right. training in, in in Hebrew from two thousand on. Right. Can I ask why you never became a trainer? That's a good question. Francine asked me the same question. Um, you know. Um, I haven't really got a good answer for that. Um, um, I only became a trainer when I actually had something to say that I felt sort of um, um, there was the RTEP and the GTEP. And that's where I became a trainer. And also because I'm, I tend to be a behind the scenes person. I organize the trainings and um, I felt less comfortable. As, I just uh, yeah, not, not, yeah, not my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. But you know fair what? Uh, Francine told me this story as well, which which resonated with me. She said that in the beginning, uh, she had difficulty talking to uh, fifteen people in the room, right? And now she can talk to a stadium with six thousand, right? Right. And I said, well, "How did you do this?" <laughs> so she said, "Well, somebody's got. Well, somebody's got to do it." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she didn't do self-treatment or have somebody treat her for it probably probably <laughs> yeah 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 um so uh, if we could move forward a little bit in time like jump a little bit forward um i know francine had her own protocol for working with recent events right, and, the, recent. Uh, well, right the, re the recent event protocol yeah and and um i know that the rtep at least has its roots in there, but it took a few jumps forward. And yeah. I wonder if you could just share what your process was of development and 
how how it came to be what it is today. Right. I was I was really not keen on early intervention for various reasons, uh, you know, because particularly also because of the uh, free associations in EMDR where you know when you start and you don't know where you're going to end up. And I mm -hmm. knew that, you know, people who had been in an accident or, or um, right. some sort of a disaster were mostly normal people who had been in abnormal situations. They hadn't come for therapy to deal right. with the clinical issues. And sort of, you know, I, I, and this is one of one of the issues. But anyway, as we said, necessity is the mother of invention. When there was the first Lebanese war, yep. um, in in uh, was it the first or the second? I've lost. No, it was the second one. The first the one was one. Uh, was in 80, 82, 83. Yeah, yeah. It was the second one. And yeah. um, we, Dr. Ilan Kutz from, um, you know. Mm -hmm. um, He's a psychiatrist from the center to the central area. He mm -hmm. had a project going on um, with people who were admitted to the uh, emergency rooms in uh, two hospitals in the north during that, you know, because of rocket attacks uh, during that, that period. And he wanted to, he, he had already been playing with, playing around with EMD, EMDR. He hadn't mm -hmm. been trained in it, but he was he had read about it, he attended a lecture and he was doing stuff. And he found sort of interesting results. And he asked us, he approached the MDR Israel Association, if we could uh, be involved in a research project for a single mm -hmm. session treatment of people who had been admitted to the emergency rooms who were still left with, with symptoms two months after after the uh, being admitted. Um, and uh, I wrote to Francine and asked, what should we do? And she sent us this manual, which is a military and disaster manual. And in there was EMD, which she had reintroduced, and the recent event protocol. Now, um, the, the curious thing is, by the way, that the, the, both of these protocols had, hadn't, apart from her original um, study in 1987 mm -hmm. uh, um, it, which if you look at it today it was it wouldn't i don't know if it would have been scrutinized uh, uh, as well because the measures were rather were, were rather um not strong measures anyway but the results were and the changes in behavior were strong um there, there are no there were no rcts for the recent event protocol at all Right. Not at all. In fact, the very first one that was ever done was in 2018 with wow. the, uh, the recent event protocol. And that was done in France, comparing it with debriefing. And mm -hmm. so, in fact, it's the only one up to today. There's only been one RCT on the recent event protocol. Okay. And, and the EMD protocol hasn't also been, uh, hasn't gone. And there are a few case studies, and there are also case studies for the recent event, but very little research because. And anyway, I'll tell you what happened. We we did this one one session intervention, and the results were initially quite good. But in the follow up, there was an erosion of gains. And Ooh. I was working with Burit Laub, and we were sort of got the understanding that it was incomplete. There was something happening here that was you know it was good initially, but it was incomplete, and. We got to the idea of not looking just at the event, but to look at the episode, the trauma episode, which was the missing yes. protocol, where it's not just the event, it's it's the event and all the everything that's happened after the event up to the present right. time. And even with concerns about the future, this is your trauma episode. And because which of course, which of course is much more um, parallel to what we teach in standard EMDR now of talking about past, present, future, not just talking about a single event. Even when there's a single event, the, the protocols all look at past, present, future. They're and the in, recent event early, protocol not, didn't do that. Not in early intervention, right. And, right, it wasn't doing that. It was actually not following what we know from our standard protocols. One was, of the things I keep on finding is that the best protocols are basically the standard protocol with tweaks. When it's not the standard protocol, it seems to be missing things. Right. I mean, it looked, it, it considered like various other people like uh, Bessel van der Kolk and Edna Foer and others that said that the the, uh, 
the memory in in, in the acute phase is fragmented, and yes. um, and that meant from the point of view of the standard protocol that you couldn't take one image to represent the entire Correct. event. Right. That you had to look at multiple targets and fragments uh, to, right. and he was going over and over the event to look for the different components of the event. Right. But you know, if you're doing this uh, several weeks or several months after the event, a lot of processing has already gone on. Right. And what happens after is the repercussions maybe what the main concerns or, or even you know i often see this you know what ha whatever happens again is the main concern right so we don't need to second guess what mm -hmm. the target should be we can let the client find the target by what we used with, with the in in the uh, artep with the google search like a mm -hmm. metaphorical google search right to to introspectively um scan the, the the whole episode to look at what is still disturbing now. And I could tell I, you from the first time when I went through the RTEP protocol with you and you introduced the Google search, I ended up in my own clinic, although I don't necessarily teach this when I'm when I'm teaching standard protocol, but for history taking, especially with let's say teenagers, I use Google search as just a way of getting history. It's a, it's it's a, it seems to be, just speak more to them than any of the other um, methods, whether it's direct questioning or it's a, or look back or affect scan, any of those don't work as well. Uh, it seems the Google search just speaks to them. Say, oh, I know what a Google search is. Um, I know how to do that. Yeah, all right. Well, it is. it, it allows the brain to find the, the target that it's ready to work on. It may be the worst right. part. We don't right. have to invite the worst part. And, and that if it is, it is. And it may be what they're just ready to work on already. Right. Yeah. Um, but I'm saying to expand it beyond episode when the episode becomes the your life. Your right. life is the episode. And you do a Google search on that, you get some really interesting results. And and if you you know, in the standard protocol where we will look at at, at what's happening now and do and then do a float back to look for, for right. root origins, uh, in a way that it is it's the Google search does it in the other direction. It's right. it's it identifies because it's early intervention. You can identify the starting point. You don't have right. to fly. We right. have it. Right. And so when I say when I say this to especially teenagers, but not only teenagers, and I say to them the same way we start off with the with the float back, I start off with what is the search terms of your Google search, and the search terms are the current experience. And now search through your life to other things that resonate. Because remember how Google searches work is that it has to do with resonance rather than being some kind of a serial search. Serial search would take forever. But resonance, it's able to go boom, boom. And, and the first three things that pop up are usually the most important. Um, if you have to go to the second page, you're probably already in stuff that's less important. Although we do an episode narrative, we hear the yeah. story from the beginning up yes. to the end. And we can hear in the story many, many potential points of disturbance. But right. when we do the Google search and they stop yes. it, one of them, and we take that as our target, we assess it yeah. and process it, there's a generalization effect. Absolutely. So that end, we don't need to usually find more than between three to five points of disturbance to integrate. With the a whole. recent event, correct. Yeah. Right. And if you want, it's almost like the Google search reveals a treatment plan. You know, yes. the, individual, I love it. the individual treatment plan. I love you know? that. That's great. That's right. great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I like, I think in pictures and I usually sort of, I think that's probably, you know, I, I work with PowerPoint a lot. I even dream PowerPoint, actually. I, if I want to think about something, I put it, I do it in a PowerPoint form. And mm -hmm. I've got these two sort of um, analogies or metaphors. Now, a new one is like, uh, you know, if we're focusing on the event, uh, it's like the, the guy who's lost the key in the, in the dark and he's looking for it under the light. The event is the light and the keys may be somewhere out there in the dark, you know, that's right. one, one new image. And the other one is the stone mm -hmm. dropping in a pond and all the ripples that ripple out afterwards are, are the repercussions of the traumatic onset that the event, right. the life changing event with ongoing consequences. Right. And I've taken this a step further that this could be an earthquake in the ocean. And when it gets to shore, it's a tsunami. Right. right, and this could very much be what's happening here right now. Right. 
people who have had this horrific, horrible events, but over time, it's it's changed their lives in so many ways. Right. I would argue, I would argue that it's also the butterfly effect. Sometimes it's something that actually does not seem important at the time when it occurs, but its implications grow and grow over time. Right now, that's not the current situation where you actually have these huge events. But sometimes it's a relatively small event that ends up ha ends up having huge meaning. Right. So we published in 2008. We we stumbled onto this in 2006, and we were working with it and presenting it uh, here and there. Uh, we first presented it even in 2006 or seven at the at the Consultants Day in London. Barit and I, and um, people immediately picked it up because they find it um, user friendly. Right. right. Uh, and, you know, one of the components that, that that we put into the protocol were also components that it's trauma focused, you know, yes. uh, so that uh, uh, there, there are safeguards and, and containment boundaries yeah. mm -hmm. and, um, and uh, resourcing so that um, it's, it's, it's very structured so that it feels safe for the client and for the therapist, the therapist. In situations the therapist must feel safe as well when you're Absolutely. going to when you're meeting people who've been through these horrific uh, events and episodes you do go into it with interpretation so yes. that once you've got a, a very structured format that has uh, very safeguards in it uh, and boundaries so that we focus only on the current episode um, mm -hmm. And we have and we have a containment. It's a yes. containment protocol. Yeah. All right. And of course, I've actually, we... in terms of containment, an additional layer of potential containment is putting together blind to therapist protocol together with, um, together with the RTEP. That sometimes there's certain parts of it a person doesn't want to tell the story, and that's okay. Yes. But we're still it, going to stay within that within that piece. Yeah. Important point we've actually added that later in that if somebody doesn't want to give the episode, they just need yeah. to think about it. And right. then we can, we can work blind. And of course, in the GTEP, which was we the next stage of applying mm -hmm. RTEP in groups where you're actually right. working individually within a group, it is all blind because there's no sharing of the trunk right. in the group. Yeah. 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 If you want to hear the story, then, well, first of all, there's the, quite a lot of research started happening, including two that we did, uh, and uh, Barit and I were involved with, in uh, Kiryat Malachi after rocket attacks, and three people who died in, a, right. uh, in one of the rocket attacks was one of our first um, uh, studies uh, that we did, and, and the second one was in Sterot, actually. Um, mm -hmm. And these are two RCTs that we did with following rocket attacks, actually. Um, and it was being picked up in many parts of the world. In fact, yeah. I've done over a hundred um, presentations uh, and trainings in RTEP and nearly as many in GTEP. Um, because GTEP is, is the one that's become more interesting for, since since the COVID and the refugee situation, um, and you know, working with staff. And, uh, right. I mean, the ability to work with a group and and help people is the efficiency of that is is you know undeniable. Right. Do you, do you want to hear about how the GTEP developed? This, please, please. Yeah, this was. Yeah. This, um, you know, the Arctic contains so many. Um, I would say, you know, at least at a theoretical level and a conceptual level, it contains um, various various elements that I, I would love to see in a group protocol, you know, uh, like relating to multiple targets, not just the worst image, you know. You know, the, the butterfly hug protocol works on the worst image, you know, and does four sets of, of BLS and uh, butterfly hugs. So I, you know, I, I thought, you know, how can we have multiple targets, and you know, BLS, butterfly hug, you know, as I say, um, I like eye movements. You know, and I don't only like eye movements. I mean, eye movements is where all the research has been done. The best research is there. Yeah. The best research, 
and uh, the uh, the brain changes in the brain and uh, the, you know the neurological aspects and I've actually written an article on it at Francine Chico's request because I at a conference I told her you know we, I mentioned she said write a write an article about it and I did and I mean there are many many good reasons for keeping the eye movements and not yeah. abandoning them because you feel uncomfortable with them you know that's yeah. what that you know that, as you say it's weird but so there are different ways of doing the eye movements for instance even in the beginning you know this you know that this thing that francine did i don't know why didn't you do this you know because people got tired you know? <laughs> they didn't right. play the violin or play tennis they got tired very quickly so you could have done this sort of saccade because the original discovery was actually a saccade it wasn't tracking right tracking right. she introduced tracking because she thought it would be too difficult to do the saccades and right. um, and do it as fast as is comfortable because it approximates the saccade she actually it was it was diagonal the right. original, the right. original right. Right. i never did i ever tell you that after after i went for the first part one training with roger i realized that one of my clients was naturally doing emdr for years with me i would ask him a question he would look away and his eyes would start darting back and forth. After about yeah. a half a minute, 45 seconds, he'd come up and said, oh, and he'd have these, these amazing epiphanies. He was doing You've selfie MDR. It was amazing. You just reminded me of something. And one of the other reasons that intrigued me with going to find out about uh, this eye movement uh, therapy that Francine developed was that when I was doing my um, bachelor's degree in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, I was actually um, a research assistant for Professor Danny Kahneman. Danny Kahneman. Nice name. I like his name a lot. <laughs> once in a while, people think, oh, you're that Danny Kahneman? No, not really. But you could make you could make. You know, I never made that association. <laughs> I didn't make that link. But you know, he's the, <laughs> he's the only psychologist that ever got the Nobel Prize. For economics. Not only for economics, but, but he, he's a psychologist. And of course, yes. he moved he moved off to Princeton after Jerusalem. But yes. when I was his research assistant, what I had to do, I had to read every single article that came out on attention because mm -hmm. he was writing a book on attention and summarize it on one page, right? Because you didn't have Google and, uh, right. and you know, internet at that time. This was way back in, believe it or not, 1971 or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and one of the articles that stuck in my mind that intrigued me was an article, an article written by someone called Day, where he talked about right movers and left movers. He said that if you ask somebody to do like, you know, 17 times uh, 8 minus 21, you know, some complicated that, their eyes moved in either right or left. And he thought, you know, why? Why do the eyes move left or, or right while they're busy? Attention goes inwards. He thought it was something to do with personality, and very often couples were opposite or something like this. Mm -hmm. And of course, I, you know, it, maybe it has something. NLP could tell you something about that. But <clears throat> so this this oh, it just was fascinating. Um, so um, I, I was always sort of interested in in, in anything to do with the perception. And uh, um, Anyway, back to to GTEP. So I wanted to have in a group in a group format things that were more similar to what was in RTEP. So that that means that we wanted to have um, some kind of focus processing, not letting right. free association, right? And and multiple targets. You know the pods points of disturbance, and eye movements like self BLS with eye movements where so. The, I got the idea of, I uh, actually started on index cards. I made up um, a whole session on index cards, you know, uh, and I just would lay them out and thinking about having a, an emergency um, kit that could be sent out where people have these index cards. They just lay them out with, with the instructions and everything where you've got the, uh, the onset trauma and, and the date today and the points of disturbance along there. And then I realized, you know, when I laid out three points of disturbance, this was a very big, I started making the, the points of disturbance a tower instead of laying them side by side. 
with the with the resources, the, the positive cognitions, the checklist, and the good memory. And then mm -hmm. I suddenly saw well, this could all be put onto one sheet instead of having right. these ones. And it, this yeah. took two years <laughs> as well. Right. So, I, and, and by 2013, I got the the worksheet and the uh, the protocol arranged and tried it out and, and with various people. I presented it at the actually at the first time I presented it or taught it was at the conference in in Istanbul. Emre Konyu invited me to 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 teach it in in Istanbul. And this was in the in the autumn of 2013. And mm -hmm. by February, they went out and started using it immediately, like they tend to do with all new mm -hmm. things. And right. they were working with refugees, uh, Syrian refugees yeah. on in the camps near the Syrian Turkish border. And they were already working with RTEP. They'd already done an RCT with, with RTEP there, but they mm -hmm. were very pleased to have a group protocol. So they, sure. they did the first um control trial with with the with the GTAP with Syrian refugees. They did two sessions. Right. Um and, uh, um and it was only published several years later. There was actually another one that was published before that, but they were the first one, the first ones to do it. Then I presented again at the conference in Edinburgh, the European conference, where actually Francine attended mm. that, that conference uh, in 2014. And um, uh, people, if we look at today now, that's 10 years on, there are about um, at least 30 projects and publications and uh, in, you know, going on in about 16 different countries. So it really yeah. has taken on, and especially during the COVID time and yeah. with refugees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I wonder if. If you even like this question, you know, before you developed what you developed, you probably didn't know exactly where you were going. You actually said that at the very mm -hmm. beginning of our talk. Um, but sometimes we do have a kind of foggy view toward the future of where things, what the next steps might be sort of heading toward. And I wonder if you have any thoughts like, where have, where has your brain been heading over, like, where do you think you're headed next? One of the, one of the, these moments came from Louise Maxfield's article on low intensity. She, she brought out a whole edition of uh, uh, dedicated to low intensity and thinking how EMDR can be um, more widely scaled up, made more available to more people. Uh, and right. you know, high intensity is what the standard protocol is, and even RTEP is and a bit less because it's brief, all right? But uh, um, Working in a group is is low intensity. In in depends in, in in low intensity has different meanings. Some people think it means para para professionals, but actually, um, I, we introduced a term called mid intensity. <laughs> There's high intensity is one to one. Low intensity perhaps could be with with para professionals or, or allied professionals who are working with various aspects of AIP informed treatments including some versions of GTA. Um, mm -hmm. And mid-intensity is where you've got a professional who's leading the group. And although, now in this article that Louise wrote, Louise Maxfield, she said that group EMDR is really guided self-help. And she described why it is, because mm -hmm. people work independently on their own traumas. You can work on different traumas in the group. They don't share the trauma. And they're just being guided. Which, of about... course, is one of the problems with debriefing, is right. that you'll sometimes have have a vicarious traumatization. Right. So this this idea of of guided self help, which is really a good description of of what happens in GTA, um, you know, it, it's because it is it's the worksheet is um, very concrete. You've laid out the, the episode. I've taken all the ideas from RTEP and put it onto this worksheet. There are yes. six steps on the worksheet and two more steps off the worksheet, eight steps, you know. In the MDI, we always have to have eight steps. Eight days. Yep. <laughs> and uh, uh, the, and the, uh, um, you've, you've made a kind of meta-communication. You've got 
uh, you've, you've created a resource rich environment. You've got a, a, pres a, a present and a past and a future resource in front of your eyes. You've got the onset trauma event and you've got the trauma episode up to today and into the future. Right. And, and when you do the bilateral stimulation, you're touching the date today, the date then with a Google search for the grounding. Right grounding being one foot in the present while you, mm -hmm. you scan all the, the the potential traumas along the episode and you do the desensitization by touching the day to day and the point of disturbance that you've discovered right and, and we do just a limited number of 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 sets because we don't know where the sets are in a group right. so we right. we don't get feedback so we do three sets and then back to focus so it's, it's kind of like the EMD strategy, not the EMD protocol, where you've right. got three, three, three associations and then back to focus. And right. for each pod, you're doing this three times. And you, on the worksheet, you've got a record of these changes in the sub levels from right. zero to 10. You see how they change or don't change. And you, you can get up to three, three different points of disturbance in a session. Right. And this is really, um, I, I needed a richer group EMDR protocol that has the elements of the RTEP because it works so well with the RTEP. Right. So why not do it with more people at one time, right? So you have, there's a trade-off because of the self-monitoring. Right. And so you really need to make sure that people are able to self-monitor before you put right. them in a group. So the mm -hmm. first step, the step one is really not only a preparation, but it's also a screening, it's screening diagnostic for readiness, right? right. And it's, and we suggest having it stand alone as being part of the intake so that you do together with psychometrics and maybe a brief interview before you construct your groups. So right. that they really have, it's really stress management. You teach them stress management in step one. And mm -hmm. if they're able to be in their window of tolerance, then they're ready to do the self-monitoring right. on the GTEP. But you have a second screening at the very end where you look at the whole episode after doing processing the three points of disturbance. You look at the whole episode and take an episode set. Yes. And that tells you if they're done, which can happen, or probably not. They need to have maybe more than one session. And, 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 or if it hasn't changed at all during the whole processing, we'll say, well, this is not for you. So right. you can re refer to individual work. So right. that it's a hierarchical kind of intervention so that you mm -hmm. don't have, you can see who can benefit from the group and who needs to have the individual work. Right. So, so I, I get students when they start to be introduced to this kind of work, they say, is there a way that we could put it in the water? And just like, or put it on TV so that we just like talk about low intensity as extremely low intensity. I said, mm, not really sure that's the direction that we're going in here. That is, that is, the, that is the thing is that because mm -hmm. you are, it, you are relying on self-monitoring, you need to right. make sure that you screen people who, for whom it is appropriate right. and it mustn't right. just go to anybody. But right. I, I have, I have made, um, um, you know, um, Judy Munch, Dr. Judy Munch, the was president of EMDR Canada for uh, two terms. Mm -hmm. She introduced during the COVID uh, something she called STEP, which is the self-care traumatic episode protocol, uh, which is based on GTEP, but it is guided on a on an internet platform with videos, where right? it's video guided, and you can only get access to it after you've been screened with the various oh, that's very good. metrics, right? You can only get right. to it. She did an RCT study with MDR clinicians in Canada, and it came out really well that they were able to use this to for self-care. And I've developed something similar now, which is a video guided self-care for clinicians, right? Because so we have right. to take I saw it. Yeah. We have to take care of ourselves. So you can actually, and I must tell you, I had really a bad day yesterday. We were supposed, to, I thought we had the podcast yesterday. Right. And, 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 uh, and something happened to put me in a really bad mood. And I'm glad we didn't meet yesterday. That wouldn't have been fun. 
Yeah, what do you mean? And um, so I did a session on myself. Mm -hmm. And you know what? It really works. It really works. <laughs> and I really recommend it strongly. Yeah. Visions, right? Because they'll know what to do if it's if it's not enough. And, so, and yeah. I mean, they, we got into this. I, I lost I lost our train of thought because I asked you, where do you see things moving toward in the future? Well, <laughs> Yeah. Well, if you have an answer to that, yeah. Yeah. No, I think it, it is in the direction of low intensity. I mean, there are things going on right now. And you, you, you're aware, you're familiar with Rolf Carrier's work. Rolf oh, Carrier. No. Uh, he he was actually it was a, um, he had as uh, positions in in the UN and in the World Health Organization, and when he retired. He had many contacts in the UN and all that, and he was actually an ambassador for EMDR and helped get the World Health uh, uh, Organization recognizing it. And he sort of uh, it was one of the people that helped. Um, he he has formed a nonprofit called uh, GIST, uh, the Global Initiative for Stress and Trauma Treatment, something like that. And he had a, a group of over 30 experts, EMDR experts, uh, met in Geneva. I was there, Nacho was there, right? And uh, Derek Farrell and other people. And um, to develop um, a, a module, six module training for um, what they call, you don't say third world anymore, low to mid income countries, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, where the needs are huge, immense, and the uh, the ability to provide uh, mental health services is so um, uh, little yeah. that uh, you need to you need to develop a cadre of people who can um, make because you know EMDR has so many but uh, has so much potential yeah. uh, and it's sort of a AIP informed treatments. So they develop six modules four of the modules are traumatology and and stabilization and and uh, cultural awareness and various kinds of things like this mm -hmm. and module five is the butterfly hug protocol and okay. module six is the worksheet protocol right the the game of the name you know and um, <clears throat> it's a slightly simplified version of, of GTEP and, and uh, IGTP. And um, it's a, a research project that's going on in, I don't know, in, in a dozen different countries uh, to, to check it out. And already there are a few publications that show that, it's, that, it's, that it can work. All right. So that's, um, I mean, the, the point is to be able to train people to be able to use it safely. Right, right, to know when to refer and when right. not to use it. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. I mean, it's not rocket science. This is the whole point of the GTEP. You'll see, because it's right. so structured, it's actually very simple to do. So it's, 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 it's using it responsibly. Right. Right. Um, you know, I could talk to you for another two hours easily. Um, and in fact, sometimes when we talk on the phone, you and I just keep on going. And I could easily have another two hours of conversation, and perhaps we will have more conversations in the future. Um, but I think we're going to call it a day for now. Okay. Um, are there any are there any ideas or thoughts that you would like to leave with whoever might be listening or watching you know, this? Uh... I think one of the things that kind of disturbs me is that you know people are not relating to what's called evidence based protocols. You know, people are doing all kinds of things. Um, without any sort of evidence based to justify it. Um, yeah. And I think that that is something, you know, if there's something that already works, you know, uh, if, it's, if it's not broken, you know, what you, you know, you don't have to fix it. So, you know, and, and also to, to take it and keep to the model, because everything has been built in there has been carefully thought out and tested right. and, tried and structured so that when people take just bits and pieces, and add their other bits and pieces. Um, it may be good, it may not be, but it, it needs to be right. tested. That's what Francine told me when I showed her the RTEP and the GTEP, she says, bring me the evidence. Right. You know, 
do the research, all right? And that's, yep. if she hadn't insisted on research, EMDR would have been just another esoteric uh, fad that came and went like Edna Foer right. thought. It was right. only the research that couldn't be ignored. And if you have the research, uh, use it. Yeah. I remember when I when I was trained as a as a consultant, I did it with Marilyn Luber, and she's a little bit, um, you know, square. Um, she's wonderful, but she is so. When she's teaching. When she's teaching, yeah. Oh no, she's not at all square. Anyway. But when she's teaching, when she's talking about about stick to the protocol, boy, does she mean stick to the protocol? And um, so I walked away from the training with her, thinking to myself, you know. I had been like, I'm a creative type of a person. So I had been doing EMDR and coming up with all kinds of wonderful things. I was so proud of myself of all the things I was doing in the office. And I said, after learning with Marilyn, I said, you know, if I'm going to be one of the people teaching this stuff, um, then I, I have to really go back to the basics, um, reminiscent of what I would do in the martial arts. And also, no, no matter what, you keep going back to your basic moves, your basic stances, and that's everything's built off of that. So I said, okay, go back to basics, just do the basics. And to my great chagrin, it was working so much better than all of my wonderful creative things. Uh, so um, I really, yeah, I was, so, I was like like um, a little dose of humility. And just remember that the, that the stuff that's been researched, just as you said, the stuff that's been researched, start there. It is the mother of invention, but when you're inventing, check your inventions. Yes, only when it's not working, you do something different, right? Right. 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 You have to have a really good reason to go off a protocol. Mm -hmm. And when you're going off a protocol, if you actually understand the protocol, then the going off of it is in order to get back to it. That is a very good point. I mean, I think we've we've both had this. Um, I've heard you say this as well, and it's one that, that I use of Picasso, right? He was a, a fine draftsman. He could draw perfectly, yes. right? But when he when he drew what he drew uh, or painted what he painted, it wasn't out of ignorance. It was out no. of knowledge. <laughs> right. Right. Absolutely. Right. I, I agree with you completely. When you depart from the protocol, it's because you know the protocol really well and yeah. it's not working or it needs, it needs assistance. You know, I've, all, yeah. I've yeah. also found that the deeper understanding of the protocol means that the leaving the protocol isn't leaving at all. It's really just stepping using a different methodology to meet the needs of the protocol, to be able to, because the protocol really is very robust and rich and it knows what it's doing. It, there's so much in there. Right. But I think that something that is not like perhaps um, uh, emphasized enough is psychoeducation. Sometimes, yes. I mean, you can even call it sort of, sort of interviews. Um, yeah. the, um, one of the ways that I, uh, describe EMDR to people is I'll say, um, you know, there are just two ways of turning a, a, a difficulty into a problem. So one way is when you try to change something that can't be changed, like the past, like the milk that is spilled. The other way is when you're not changing something that can be changed, right? Like the way you think about it or whatever. EMDR gives us the wisdom to tell the difference. Yes, that's lovely. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm always saying to my clients and my my students that that our working on the past is not to fix the past, but working on the past is to fix the present and the future. Right. It's just right. a vehicle. The past is a vehicle to work on. Like what happened happened. We can't change what happened. Right. What is still disturbing you now? You know, yeah. you're making this differentiation between the past and the present. Yeah. On the way. Yeah. And here we go. We're going to go into, if we keep going, we will not stop. Um, so uh, I'm I'm guessing that at some point we're going to have another conversation and share it with whoever's interested in listening. Um, Elon, thank you so much for giving me some of your time. I'm glad I'm meeting you on a good day and not a bad day. Uh, <laughs> um, so um, yeah, really, I, I, Thank you. Just thank you so much for all the work that you've done. Um, you know, at this point, the thousands and tens of thousands of people that have been helped just because you've taught so many people, who've taught so many people, who have helped so many more people. It's like, you know, 
Um, well, I'm yeah. the principle of, of um, teaching people to fish rather than handing out fish is, yeah. is a guiding light. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you for doing the podcast. I saw the one you did with Roger Solomon. I learned a few things there. Isn't Isn't it what, yeah, he's so good. He's so wonderful. Um, yeah. Anyway, so again, thank you so much. And um, I'll, we'll be seeing each other and we'll be talking. Okay. Uh, I look forward to the, to the next um, um, real strokes of brilliance that you have.